hello and welcome to Healing Art After Hours, where I upload videos of live Zoom creative workshops from my Healing Art Happy Hour meetups. This is the first installment of a five-part watercolor foundations workshop, and in this video I will be discussing watercolor supplies and materials to assist you in selecting the best materials for your needs and to help you avoid some pitfalls and frustrations that are common for beginning watercolor artists. Handouts for this slide presentation are available for download at my shop at creatingspacecoastal.com. Enjoy. So the first part of this is materials. I think those are really important. And the biggest thing that I wanna talk about is how there is such a range of materials available. There's different ranges of qualities from, from below student really, from anything from you know grade school student level to you know college school level to, artist level, and they just behave differently. So I'm talk, gonna talk a little bit about how they behave differently, not because you, you know, I think you should go out and buy artist quality from day one. I just think you need to be aware of what some of the limitations of non-artist quality that you might find. And it really depends on, on the grade that you get. There's some really great art or student quality out there too. So I just want you to understand how the materials work so that if you are struggling with a certain challenge, you understand that it could be the materials, not your technique. So let's start with paper. Um, there's a range of 100% cotton, which is the high, highest quality down to just a mix of paper fiber um, could be, and they don't usually don't give the ingredients of the paper if it's not 100% cotton. So if you don't find this 100% cotton written on there, it's not, um, it's good. It could be a mix of cotton and paper fiber or just paper fiber um, and it could be a range of quality. Um, so just be aware of that. The, the thickness of the paper matters as well. If you have a, thinner paper, you're going to get more buckling and you have to stretch it and tape it. And, and it's, I mean, it's a good idea to tape anyway, but if you use less than 140 pound, I don't recommend that honestly for watercolor, unless you're doing really dry techniques where you're not adding a lot of water, you can do it with more. If you're doing just a dry brush, and not a lot of washes, then you can use, you know, really any, any lightweight is fine. But I'd say if you're going to be adding some water doing um, doing washes, getting getting a lot of moisture on there, you're gonna wanna use at least 140 pound or else you're gonna be frustrated with the, the amount of buckling that you're gonna get with the paper. So it's just gonna be more frustrating for you. So that's what I would recommend 140 pound for starters. There's all, you know, 300 pound and up is like heavy weight. So if you're doing big pieces with tons of water, then you would wanna have that really thick paper. But for now, I would just recommend 140 pounds. Shauna? Yeah. I use 140 pound, but I find that it buckles. I guess, is that what you mean when it rolls up as soon as it get, gets wet? Yes. And that's yeah. why I, I, even with 140 pound, you should, you know, taping it down to the surface is going to help. I do. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's going to, it's going to have some, it's going to have some buckliness. I mean, with the more water, really the way to get it, there's, you know, you can do some stretching, which I think has to do with wetting it and then laying it out and, and taping it. And you can go through that process. So research stretching, if you want to really try to get rid of that, any buckling, but there's, unfortunately, when water gets, when water fibers, especially if it's paper fibers versus cotton and, and the cotton paper is gonna do better at this as well. But it's just that the fibers expand. And so where the fibers are wet, they expand. And then when they dry, they usually shrink up, but maybe they don't shrink up quite as much as they started. So that's okay. how, why you get the buckling. Um, and like I said, there are ways to do, to try to minimize that through what's called stretching. So I don't demonstrate that here just because um, that's a little bit deeper process, but maybe I'll consider doing that for people that want to know. But um, I just expect some some buckling in my, or some a little bit of curling, but I do try to keep it taped down until it's completely dry. And that does help. Sometimes wetting the back of the paper too, um, so that, so that the back side is getting just as wet as the front side, you know, like before you do your project. That sounds scientific. I like it. 
<laughs> you know, because then you've got the backsides expanding as well. So if you wet yes. the whole thing and then, you know, and that's, I think that's part of the stretching process. That totally like, makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that is the challenge, you know, and, and again, it depends on the, the paper. I find that um, even just the same weight paper in like this, uh, this, uh, this Canson versus the, well, this is of course cotton too, but it feels thicker. It feels um, stiffer for, for me, even though it's the same weight, this, uh, and then that's probably because of the, the cotton fiber, but um, so, so even within the same weight range, there's going to be different qualities of paper and they're going to behave differently too, because it depends also on how much the binder that they put, you know, it's kind of like they put starch and binders in there and the way that they do that, it, they might really mix it into the fibers when they produce it, or they might just lay it on top, like ironing it on and that can affect it as well. And that's why different papers behave differently. So sure. I another paper as well. Right. I will ask one more question and then let other people. No. Um, I have 184 pound, but I haven't been using it because it's a lot more money. So is, um, would that make a difference? The, the heavier the weight, yes. The, the less it's going to, um, to buckle. I've never heard of 140 pound that's, or 184 pound. Well, I think but that's what it is. Oh, okay. Interesting. That's just, that's just an interesting weight that I've, I've that sounds like really specific. Yeah, it's a strap more, strap more. Okay, interesting. Um, oftentimes, yes, but again, because even the same weights are different, different production and different quality in how they make it. Um, you'll find, for example, some of the lower cost ones, have one side that's really designed for painting and the other side has almost like machine, like a machine texture, like it was rolling through the machine. So really it's only paintable on one side. Whereas if you get, for example, this arches, it's paintable on both sides. And so you can tell by looking at the top texture, if, you're, if you have like a pad of paper, you look at the top and the way the texture looks there. If you look at the bottom, it looks a little different. Then, then you'll know that the bottom's probably not designed for painting. It's more just a single-sided paint, which normally that's fine, unless you want to re, unless you want to repurpose something. You know, sometimes people don't like their painting and then they flip it over and paint on the other side. But, um, but there is a huge range of of paper qualities. So just being aware of what, you know, one thing might be how one might behave versus another. I've used, you know, like I said, 140 pound, two different brands and they act differently. One buckles a lot and one doesn't buckle as much. So try different brands too. It can get expensive. Paper is really, is kind of an important element of watercolor um, because the paper really does interact with the medium. It is, it is science. It is art and science, watercolor. So, um, so try it. If you can get like a single sheet of different brands, sometimes they do samplers too. Um, if you go to an art shop, they sell it single sheet and you can try different brands and see what, you, you know, find the one you like. And that's true of all of the materials is play around with different brands and different qualities to see what works for you. Um, and that might be something you get to down the road. For now, you, if you can accept the buckling, I'm going to try to do something, but I don't want to suggest it until I try. I was going to try ironing mine, but I don't know how much that'll damage it. So, <laughs> so we'll see. So I don't do it until I, I'll try it first. <laughs> see, a heavy it steam. Huh? With a heavy steam. Or yeah. Yes. Spray. Like, like, like mist the back of it. Yeah. I was going to try some things, but I don't want to oh, recommend that cool. until I try it and see if that works. Well, you can try it on a little square like you use. And yeah, uh, exactly. I'm exactly. not going to cry over that. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's why I love the mini watercolors because you can try it out. Thank you. Oh, no problem. No problem. So as I was talking, I mean, I kind of mentioned all of these things, you know, there's different ways that they produce it. There's handmade molded, you know, machine milled. Um, so they're just different levels of quality. Try different ones. Um, like artist loft is a real, you know, it's cheaper, it's lower quality. So if you're practicing techniques and just brush strokes, then there's, then I would say get a cheap, you know, get, get a cheaper quality, lower quality one for practicing brush strokes. 
and technique until you feel like you're actually making, if you're going to make a piece that you're going to give away, then use the higher quality. Just know mm -hmm. that there are some limitations in how the paint will behave on the page. Um, and I mentioned the different content. And also there's three different main textures. There's hot press, which if you think of hot presses and, and ironing, it's a smoother. So they essentially do press it smooth so that it doesn't have as much texture. And this hot press is, is best for fine details. If you're going to be, you know, doing like, um, you know, animal fur, things like that, where you really want each stroke to be shown in fine detail. Cold press is, is got kind of a medium level of tooth. That's what I recommend for beginners. It's just, it kind of, you can do some detail, but also get some texture in the paper, some tooth, which is what it's called. And that can help with some dry brush techniques and things to get some, add some texture to your your work. And then rough, if you really like that dry brush or that, that white showing through, that texture showing through, if you're doing something that you want it to look really rough, maybe you're doing boulders or things like that and you want the paper to add to that, you can, um, you can do rough and it's fun with wash work too because the more tooth or the more texture, the more the water and pigment will move around and dance around the page interest in interesting ways. So you can get that with rough. They come in several different forms. Uh, the most popular are pads, uh, blocks, or sheets. Blocks are a little more expensive, but they're basically the papers glued down on all sides so you don't have to tape it down anywhere. It's basically essentially sort of taping it down for you. And then you can separate it off the block. But it is a little more expensive to do that, um, to, to buy it in that form. And, uh, and then you can only use one page at a time because you just use the top page and you can't use any more pages until you pull, peel that one off. So be aware of that. And then you can buy it in solo sheets. Usually those are larger size, but they come in different sizes and you can cut them down. You can buy a big sheet and cut them down to whatever size you're looking for. All right, choosing brushes. Brushes of course come in a variety of sizes and I don't re recommend a specific size because it really depends on the size of your canvas. How big of a painting are you going to be working on? I'm doing these mini masterpiece, you know, these mini watercolors. So I'm using a pretty small, small sizes. And I'll be talking about my materials in a little bit. But, but you're going to choose those based on the size that you're working with. And, um, and, and it's good to have a mix of sizes because even within your painting, you're gonna to, going to sometimes be doing more detail. So you want smaller brushes and sometimes you're doing broader strokes, covering more ground and you want larger. The longer the bristle, the more paint that it can hold. So you'll notice even within the same shape or the same width of a, like for example, a flat brush, some brushes, some bristles might be longer and some might be shorter. And, and that's why is because it, you can get a longer stroke. You can, you can um, it holds, more paint so you can do a longer stroke basically with the longer bristles, the longer bristles. There's different shapes and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. The most common is the flat uh, or mop for washes, but I like the flat um, personally, if I'm only gonna pick, if you're trying to limit what you get, I would suggest flat and round as two of my favorite that I, that I use if I'm really trying to minimize. Now I, have a variety of shapes that I'll be using, but those are the two basics that I would recommend for beginners. And then um, they're made of a variety of materials from natural to synthetic. And natural, you can get, you can get um, high quality natural and you can get high quality synthetic. And um, one of the thing about naturals is it tends, they tend to be more, um, more porous because it's natural hair. So it can absorb more paint, more water, and it's a little bit thirstier brush than the synthetic, but you can get some really high quality synthetics that mimic natural. So if you really, you know, for whatever reason you want synthetic, they tend to be cheaper, but some naturals are gonna be cheaper and not as high quality as some synthetics. So it's kind of a mix out there of different things. The Kalinsky Sable is, is kind of the high end. And the nice thing about that is it's, it holds a lot of paint 
And the reason that's important is because each brush stroke, you don't wanna run out of paint while you're trying to finish a, a stroke. Um, you don't wanna to have to go back and dip and then try to re-blend that. You wanna get as long as you can, depending on what you're working on. So that's helpful for that. It also is a little bit more springy. So it keeps its shape a little better than some of the other natural, like the squirrel. Um, and there can be really, like I said, the cheap, the you know cheaper natural as well. So just be aware that there's a variety. I do have a link here that goes a deeper dive into all of these uh, various ones. But uh, and then also be aware if you're if you're getting synthetic because you you know don't want animal harm and that sort of thing. Be aware that sometimes it'll say synthetic, but it could be a blend with natural. So if you're you're vegan and you want to make sure that it doesn't, you know, find find out more about that manufacturer, there there are bl definitely blends because they get some of the benefits of the natural, but also uh, the benefits of or the cost of the synthetic. Synthetic's also a little springier; it tends to hold its shape a little bit better than some of the natural ones. So play around with some different ones, but just know that there's quality synthetic and quality natural and there's no some people some artists prefer natural some prefer synthetic so it's really you know up to you to play around and try your what you like um this is the anatomy of a of a paintbrush and the reason this is important is because there'll be times when i'm going to be telling you you know use the tip of the brush and there's times that i'll say be using the belly of the brush the brush and they make different shapes. And so, so I just want you to know, you know, these things when I'm using this ling language, the ferrule is what holds the bristles and the size of the brush is usually related to the width of this um, tip of how big this, the ferrule is where the bristles are in. So be aware of that. Um, and then each brush should have information about the size and you'll notice this one has just six and I'll talk a little more about sizing in a minute but that's really ambiguous like what does six mean um does that mean that this is six millimeters well we'll talk about that shortly and it you should tell you what type of brush it is this is a round brush and give you some information so if you're following along with an artist and you want to use exact same materials you know this is the information that you want to get um, the the thing to know is that this size doesn't necessarily, isn't gonna be the same for one brand versus another. So we'll get to that shortly. There's also, as I mentioned, a variety of shapes of brushes and they have different, uh, they, they make different shapes on the page and I will be showing that a little bit later too, some more details about that. But, um, but the flat is, is this one and the round is the one that's just basically pointed at the tip. And it's very flexible because you can get these really fine points, but you can also create little wider strokes. So this is an example of a chart that shows sizes. And the reason I show this, this is only a sample for one brand, but oftentimes the brush might have a number on it like that six, for example. So in this case, that six is four thirty-second inches. That means that the ferrule is that size or 3.2 millimeters. Now this number doesn't correlate specifically with any other number. I think it just has to do, and this is just my guess, I'm speculating here, but I think they just decide where they're gonna start and they just, the next size gets the next number. And each manufacturer makes maybe different size brushes. They like maybe the next manufacturer may maybe only makes about half of these sizes. So their number system is going to be a little bit different. So if you're watching an artist and they say they, they're using a six, it, you know, you could go out and look for a six, but it may or may not be close to what their six is. So I just want you to be aware of that because that could be frustrating if you're trying to follow along with somebody and they say, I'm using a six. If you're not using the same brand, it may not be the same thing. So what you want to ask the instructor or want to learn is how big is this measurement? if you're trying to follow the same size. So be aware of that. And again, this, you know, and even with these, the size here for a six doesn't match the size over here with the six. So mm -hmm. just be aware of that. So you're not frustrated when you're trying to follow along <laughs> and buying materials. And then choosing paint. 
Um, paint is basically made up of a crushed mineral pigment and binders um, and basically binders uh, that keep that hold the paint together and and sometimes you know fillers or extenders things that you know keep them from going bad or drying out and things like that so the the higher quality paints are going to have first of all higher quality uh, pow, you know pigment which is that crushed mineral maybe they might use a mix of minerals to try to you know to try to get close to a color when you when you look at we'll talk a little bit more about this color stuff in the in the color section too but um historically like if it was cobalt blue for example it's crushed cobalt that's why it's called cobalt because cobalt was the historically the, the traditional mineral that was used to make that color. So you'll see cobalt blue hue on maybe a generic, you know, paint. And that means that there's, they're basically mixing some colors, some pigments that may not have cobalt in them, but they, they basically simulate the color of cobalt. So what you get with a higher quality is you get maybe more single pigment, meaning they don't use a mix of the minerals to make the color. And so it's a more pure color. And it also has less binder to pigment ratio. So you get more color in a smaller amount. And what I find people having uh, frustration with when they're using some of those, maybe they buy like those pan paints that are just generic that you might find at Michael's or Hobby Lobby or I don't know, Walmart is that it takes so much water and so much effort to get that pigment to lift. And they never get that full saturation of color when they bring it to the paper. Uh, watercolor always lightens once it dries anyway. And so you get this really, what I call this anemic color. It's really transparent or maybe it's even chalky. You know, It just doesn't have the vibrancy that you might get as you go to a higher quality. You don't have to go all the way to professional. Uh, there's some really quality uh, student paints out there, but there's also some really low, low quality paints out there. So depending on what you're using, you may have to make multiple layers to get the vibrancy, or you might not just achieve that vibrancy. It might just always kind of have a chalky, maybe cartoony look to it. So just be aware of that. Um, and if you are buying that, that you know something that says cobalt blue, blue hue, just know that it's not necessarily. It doesn't mean that it's lower quality necessarily. Sometimes they use, um, sometimes the the color, the mineral that was used originally is no longer used because of toxicity or availability or a variety of reasons. But oftentimes you see with the lower qualities, you'll see more of the ones that are labeled with hue as opposed to cobalt blue, which means it's using the cobalt mineral. So just knowing that um, differentiation. Okay, so you might also find with some of the lower qualities that maybe the granules, the minerals aren't ground down as fine. So you get more granulation. And sometimes that's that granulation is fun to use in your for texture in your paint. And sometimes the really highest qualities have the granulation. Certain colors tend to have more granulation. And what I mean by granulation, if you'll look at this, if this paint here that's on this slide, see how there's these like speckles in there? That's, that's kind of like simulates a granulation of that paint. So you get little, little concentrated speckles of that color in there. There's um, another element of, of paint is permanence or light fastness, so fade resistance. And of course, the higher quality, the less, the more permanence and light fastness, fastness you're typically going to get. And even within the higher quality paints, some are more or higher than others. So just being aware of that. Um, Donna, I'm buddy. Yeah. No. Um, it's okay to mix the different ones, the permanence, like with the uh, hue with a permanent permanent one, a transparent one, it, like you can mix them all, right? Yeah, my palette is a mix. Uh, I have different brands, uh, different, yes. So you can okay. mix, yeah, you can, you can mix them all. Now be aware 
that um, especially when you're blending colors, you know, some play nicer than others, you know, some mix better, you know, maybe the colors that you're seeing on there, if they're, if they're paints that have a variety of minerals to make up, for example, if it's a cobalt blue hue and you mix it with red, you're maybe, as opposed to cobalt blue, you might get a different purple or, or a muddier purple than if you are mixing a pure color with a pure color. So this is why down the road, I'll talk about mixing your own color palette because it's important to know what your paints do. They, you can mix all of them, but some are gonna play nicer together than others. And that's just gonna be from experience to try. And that's even within the same brand or whatever, you know, you're, you're gonna wanna see what your paints do when they, when they mix and mingle. I'm new at this and I have gauche, gouache, whatever. Wash, yeah. Wash. I have the Winsome Newton. I have a nice big palette. Uh, but I have two nice trays that I mix, have mixes. So I, I think, I thought it's just me, but you do actually have to do that, right? Um, to, oh, to mix to the try, paint? Yeah, to, to mix it up and to get the, what, what it is exactly that you're looking for. Yeah, there's a lot of mixing that will go on and I'm, I'm not going to be doing the demos today, but next month when I do them, you're gonna see, I do a lot of mixing. So you definitely wanna utilize your palette. Some people mix right in their, in their um, the color wells where their paint is, but you know, then they, then their paints get a little bit, you know, tainted with other colors. So you don't wanna necessarily do that. You wanna take the color and you can do some of that, but you wanna mix it in your palette to get them to maximize the range of colors that you're going to be having. I so, found it online. I love porcelain. I was using- Oh yeah, white. porcelain's great. And this one has been amazing. Yeah, that looks very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice. Keep and I, together. I often have, um, like for me, what I've been using lately, just cause I don't have a lot of space here, is I, I got these water jars and um, and they're just plastic inside, but I'm using the caps and I use one cap for my cool colors and one cap for my warmer colors, which I washed it recently, but my reds and oranges and yellows. So I, I mix them up in there and then I, and I basically, these are bas what I use for my mixing. And I'll, and I'll talk, you know, I'll talk more about that down the road a little bit in this, but, um, but yeah, you do want to play around with what you have. You want to, you do want to learn some mixing um, and, and you'll understand more about that by the end of this, hopefully about why you want to know that. <laughs> um, another, another characteristic of paints is transparency. Some colors. Now you talked about gouache. Gouache is a watercolor that is opaque, meaning it does not, um, it's not transparent. So the higher the opacity, the less transparent or the less see-through the paint is. So the less you're gonna see the paint underneath it. So the gouache series are all designed to be or, or more opaque and more chalky. You're not gonna see, you know, you're not gonna see as much of the color underneath as you would with normal watercolor paint. So just be aware of that if you're using the gouache. And there's certainly, I don't have a gouache palette. I have, um, so I don't, I haven't used a lot of them. And I, so currently, I mean, I'll get, I'll get there probably at some point, but um, I haven't used much gouache and I, I haven't used gouache for mine, but it, it looks almost more like how acrylics would act, you know, where you can lay color on top of other color and you keep that, that color um, rather than having the translucence and getting the color underneath to show. Part of the fun of watercolor is having that transparency and layering those and getting those colors. And, and we'll talk a little more about that too. But because they, even within, like I said, a palette, there's different transparency in each color based on the mineral it's being used. And, and so, so we're gonna have some exercises for you to do to, to play around with your paint to see how yours acts. And um, so that you can understand you know, what your paint does. Um, oh, there's also staining and staining means that if I lay it down on the paper and then I try to lift it, let's say, and I'll be talking about that technique later, but 
if you if you painted a brush stroke on the page and you went, oops, I don't want that, and you took and you immediately, while it's wet, took a paper towel and just dabbed it, oftentimes you can lift that pigment and paint right up. So depending on how much staining it does, it may leave color on your paper or it may lift completely up. So that's the staining power. Uh, some lift better than others. You know, oftentimes some of the reds, for example, alizarin crimson is really staining. And if you lay that down, you're not, you're gonna, you're not gonna, never gonna lift to a white page with that paint. Whereas some paints you can really lift it up and get that white back. But so those are just some characteristics of the of the paint. And um, and each brand and everything has, and each color, even within each brand, has its own personality. So it's important to learn what yours is. Now, here's an example of Windsor and Newton, which is a very popular brand. They have a you know a really popular student grade the Cotman collection, which is much cheaper. It's almost half the price of the professional watercolor. So if you're just starting out and you want to, but you're, you know, you're serious about getting to understand watercolor and really being able to do it, I would start maybe here because you can get some good quality, you know, you're going to get a lot of this, a lot of the, um, the, the quality that you're looking for, but not at the cost, you might have to do a little bit more. You might have to layer a little bit more to get the vibrancy. It's not gonna be quite as quality as the professional level. So there is a reason to pay that extra amount. You use less, for example, per, because you know if you have to lay four, if you have to lay four layers down to get the depth of color, to lay one layer of this, you're obviously gonna you know, use more of the pigment to do that. So, um, it, it's worth it, but I wouldn't start there. I would start at something like this just to, to find out if this is really for you before you go to the next step. Um, and like I said, you can get some pretty, you can do a lot. A lot of professionals use this all the time and get some really good effects with it. So, um, so again, student quality, more affordable. There's a high range of quality within that. So you know, there's very, very low to, to pretty moderately high. Uh, lower ratio of pigments to binders, the color may not be as vibrant, maybe more chalky or opaque, um, and where you do really want the transparency. Sometimes you may not get it as much with some of the cheaper ones and may have more granulation. So we talked about those. Research, you know, research what other people say about different brands, you know, because every artist, swears by their their brand. I swear by M. Graham, that's my favorite. I haven't tried everyone. So it's my favorite because it happened to be the one that I landed on before trying all of them. I'm never, you're never gonna afford to try all of them. Well, I couldn't afford to try all of them, but um, but I, you know, I did my research and I saw what people talk, how people talked about it. It's got a honey base, it stays nice and gummy and and it picks up and reactivates really nicely and I like that and I'm very happy with it but you know all artists swear by their brand so do research and try out a couple different things maybe get a tube of this a tube of that and see what you like there's different formats you can get a tube versus cake or pan let me just show you this picture this is an example of you can buy it in these little cakes and they sit in a in this pan like a little square and those are those come dry and then you reactivate them by adding water. This is actually a stick that you that you could use. I've never used any th that before. Um, and then the tube comes out just like uh, you know acrylic tubes that come out kind of wet, kind of like a toothpaste. Um, and I do recommend if you're new to let those sit in your palette overnight to start to harden a little bit so that you don't uh, get too much of it because when they're real wet, it's easy to take too much pigment. It's not like acrylics where you wanna grab the paint and put it on the canvas. You're, you're always gonna be mixing it with water and various levels of water. You're not usually going to be taking pure paint. But if you're doing a larger piece, you may want more paint to start with. So the tubes really give you the flexibility of being able to get as much paint uh, pigment as you need and activate it. Um, and then you can always refill your pans with the, the tubes at any point. It does, little does go a long way. They last, they last a long time because 
you know, especially if it's the higher quality and you can use less of it. Um, the pans are nice for travel, you know, but again, you can put, make a pallet and if it, once it hardens and firms, it's travelable. Now mine, because it's got a honey base, it doesn't dry completely to the point where if I lay, if I lay my pallet on its side, it starts to slowly move. Um, some of them dry a little firmer than that and work better for travel. Mine, it just happens to not be, but I, I'm okay with it. I use a different, I use actually Cotman for my little travel, my little travel paint. So um, I have a little kit of the pans. Now choosing your colors, as you may know from color theory, and we're gonna go into color specifically in a little bit, but um, in color theory, basically we know that the primary colors are yellow and blue and red. And so if you have those three colors, you're going to be able to mix all the other colors. And that's in theory true, but depending on which color yellow or which color, um, yeah, yellow, which color red and which color blue you're using, you're gonna get a variety of the secondary colors. So I always recommend, um, you know, and people tend to recommend even within the color palettes, the warm colors like the red, the red and yellow, um, there's cooler versions and there's warmer versions, which I'll talk about in the color theory. But it's always a good idea to have a kind of a warm yellow, a cool yellow, warm red, cool red. So having uh, basically a split palette where you have a warm and cool shade of each of the main colors that you wanna work with. So that's this is an example of a Windsor and Newton um, palette that you might consider for starting off, just to have a, you know, now, if you wanna really, really start basic, you wanna have one yellow, one red and one blue, you know, and then mix everything, you can do that, but just know you're gonna do a lot more mixing to try to get like those, color, those other colors and they might not come out the way you want them to, depending on the formula of that color. Here's an example of a color wheel that shows where these common colors that are out there uh, land on the color wheel. And as you move around the color wheel one direction clockwise or counterclockwise, it's basically adding more of, of another color. So if I started red and I added more yellow to it, it's gonna move this direction. And then once I get to yellow and I now I'm adding more blue because that's the primary color, then it starts to move, continue around to to tell it gets to blue. So as you're going towards the next primary color, you're just adding that primary color to get those in, in betweens. So this turns cooler as it goes towards blue, the yellow does, and it goes warmer as it turns towards the red. So as I look at the colors over here, these colors are gonna be warmer than these colors. So if I'm picking a warm and a cool shade of yellow, for example, I would pick something that's over on the warm side and then something that's over on the cool side. Or maybe, you know, something neutral and then something that's a little bit warmer. So, you know, that's what I mean by warmer and cooler. And this is just a chart that helps. As you go towards the center, it's basically adding like shade. So it's not warmer or cooler going inwards, it's going darker, darker shades, like if you added black. So that's what this means. And if you want to go deep dive into color theory, you can go to this link here because <laughs> there's a lot about color theory and I'll be talking more about it shortly. If you're looking at um, comparing different paints across different brands, be aware that the way that different companies name their paints, this is sort of the marketing name. So Hooker's Green, for example, is a marketing name and you'll notice that in this, these three brands, this is the brand I use, this color is completely different. So let's say you're, you were using Daniel Smith, but you decide you wanna to move to M. Graham and you ran out of your hooker's green and in the middle of a project and you, so you, then you buy the M. Graham hooker's green, you're not gonna get the same thing. So just being aware of that, there, there is the pigment color the his, or the historical color, and then there's the marketing color. And 
there is a there are these formulas that help to determine you know what these colors are which I'll again talk more about in the color theory section but I just want you to be aware of that if you run out of a hooker's green in one brand don't think you're going to get a hooker's green in another brand that's going to be the same necessarily it could be depending on the formula but look at the formula this is the pigments that it's made up of to get a clue about what to expect if these formulas are the same then it's likely that you're going to get the same color if they're different then they're not going to be the same color and this formula is sort of like if you go to home depot and they mix your paint you know it's just made up of a, a, basically a recipe to make that color. This is the same thing here. This is the recipe of the pigments used to make this paint. And these are the markers. So if it's PY, it's pigment yellow, pretty easy. So these are just pigment orange, pigment black, pigment W. So you'll see these in a, in a higher quality paint, you're gonna see this form, you're gonna see this information on the label. And it's going to give you information about light fastness, permanency, transparency, all those things you're going to find. So if you want to learn more about reading labels, you can go to this link here. Yes. I do feel bad being the only one asking questions. That's um, okay because other people might be thinking questions and they just don't ask. So okay. If say you have the Daniel Smith Hooker's Green, but all you can get, or you come home with the uh, M Graham or no, say you're using the M grain because this to me is easier and you come home with Daniel Smith to finish your project, you could add to that Daniel Smith to make the M grain hooker screen. Well, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna try to basically emulate this color by mixing and this, and you may use this or you may use other greens or other, you know, other things in your palette to try to get to this color. Yeah. Um, you know, if, so you're right. not lost. Well, it, it just means that you're not going to get that you're not necessarily going to get the exact same one. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you can't try to get to this. It just and it may not work with this one. It may be a mix. It may be by mixing some blues and yellows together that you already have in your palette to get this color. This mm -hmm. color, this has a lot of blue in it. I don't I don't um, you know, so you could try to add more yellow to this, you know, or maybe even a little red to this to try to get this color. But um, but you're gonna have to mix something to get it. You're just, you're not gonna necessarily even use this one to make right. it. Right, okay. But you, it doesn't mean you're, it's all is lost. It, you'll, it's just gonna be tricky to get that exact color. Um, you could try, if you knew the formulations of other things you had in your palette and you had, a, you had one that was a pigment green seven, and one that was a pigment green yellow, then, I mean, a pigment yellow 110 and a pigment green seven, and you mix those together, then you would get be able to get something like this. So you could look, start looking at your, your the other things in your palette and see if you have anything with these pigments in them. Because that's gonna be how you're gonna get, more likely to get to that color. And I'll, and I'll tell you how to figure out what that pigment green yellow is or the pigment green seven is in a, in a little bit when we get to the colors. Because there is a chart that helps with that. So I'm using M. Graham. I'm using currently what I'm demonstrating with is this because this my this is in storage. But this is my this is my favorite, but it's very expensive. I wouldn't start there at all. Um, it's cotton and it's double sided and it's great, but it's expensive. There's um, oops, there's this is working perfectly fine. I'm getting some, you know, I'm, I, I can't, there's something limitations with that. I can't do scrubbing I'm finding because the paper is just a little more delicate, but it works, it's been working really good. Um, M Graham is between nine and $15 for a tube. So it is kind of expensive. I don't re necessarily recommend starting there either, but I'm just letting you know what I'm using. So if you see that, you know, I'm getting this vibrancy and you're not, just know it's based on the fact that I'm using this particular brand and what you're using might be different. Um, and then I have a picture of some of the brushes that I'm using, and then I have a list of them out here. So you can check that out. This is my palette. This is my full palette and it includes mostly M ground, but I also have some not, I have some, a mix of things and I don't know which one's which because I, they're, the actual paint tubes are in storage, but 
Um, these are the, these are what I currently am using. However, if I was just going to pick a small palette, I would I would do this. I would go through and say, okay, here's a here's a little bit of a um, you know cooler yellow, and here's a little warmer yellow. And then I and I would take or actually this is this I kind of count as um, kind of gold in my in my neutrals. But this is what I would pick up if I was just going to limit my palette to the most minimal colors. So I'm just kind of showing you that I don't need 33 colors in my palette. If I was going to do a fuller palette, which is what I would recommend, like doing the warm and cool of each, I would add these. So I have a warm and cool of each of these colors. And this one is a mix. So I don't, I don't really have a warm and cool of this, although ultramarine is, has a little bit of violet. So I, I would count that. So this is just an idea. I don't have any pink here. So that's not just, that's not white because it's, I just don't have any paint on that because I was out of it at the time. And I wouldn't have these colors. I wouldn't have gold or neutral tin or lamp black, but, but um, these, this is the basic palette that I would pick. So I'm just showing you that I have a bunch, but I wouldn't necessarily need all of them. I do use a lot of them. How I think I would add indigo though, because I am finding that I use indigo almost every time time. I love it for my almost like a black or a shadow. So I would include that as well. But now to, to understand your palette, it's, it's a good idea to create a palette sheet like I did this. I, I basically did it, you know, try to do the full pigment and then, and then I would dilute it out to get a light version so I can see the range of it. This was really cheap paper, so it didn't do very good gradients, um, but I didn't want to waste good paper on, on this. But I, you can see this is the lightest shade of this, and this is the most concentrated. So I can get a range of how this paint looks like on the paper. Um, you could do that with some additional information. This was a, one artist you know, created this template, and they put all of the information about the paint, the name of the paint, and then the formulas, the transparency, blah, 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 um, up here. And then they had a space to do the gradient. And this transparency test, this is to show if, if you see this black line, then it's, this paint is transparent. If you don't, it's not. So if that disappears, that's showing that the paint is more opaque showing over that line. And then this is to show the permanency or staining. So if I try to lift after I paint it down, this is showing whether and how well it lifts off the page. And then the diffusion test, which is basically uh, you wet the paper and then do a drop and you see how far this paint travels. Some of the paint, the pigment's a little heavier. So it maybe it stops you know, sooner than if it's a really light pigment, moving pigment, sometimes they just explode out and go all the way. So that's just a, a, a template you could use if you wanted to really get some details about how your paint works. And there's a link here to learn more about that uh, as well. But that could be a helpful way to learn about your paints. I also recommend, and I'll show, I'll show my versions of this uh, a little bit later, but doing a, um, doing some swatches. So this is basically layering. And you can see how sometimes you can really see underneath the color that's below it. And sometimes you can't, it, it kind of hides it. But th this is to see what, how your paint behaves with other paint layering it. So it's different to glaze or layer than it is to mix the colors in a palette, for example, and then and then lay them on the on the paint. So this is mixing them. So if I took, for example, if I took these two colors, I don't know if these are the same ones, but if I took these the, this color plus the color underneath and I mixed it and I created this. But this is how it would look if I layered this color on top of this color. So does that make sense? One of them is how they look layered, and one of them is how they look mixed. These are other supplies that I use um, in making special effects, and we'll be talking more about the special effects later. But for the full list of things that I will be using throughout next month, um, this covers the majority of it. So there's lots of little side things that you know that can be helpful um, in this process. 
Now, th this is just a list of different places online and also places within San Diego where you can get art supplies. You can get student quality supplies at Michael's or Hobby Lobby, um, even sometimes that you know Walmart might have a little bit of stuff, but um, I would say at least go to Michael's or Joanne's to get, um, you know, to get things as opposed to a Walmart because that's going to be more, you know, less likely to find the the higher student quality. Um, but if you want to get some of the more professional or college student type studio quality, then check out some of these art art stores or online art places. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Healing Art After Hours. You can download materials related to this topic, including PDF notes of PowerPoint presentations at creatingspacecoastal.com. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you found this content helpful, and join me for the next video here at my Creating Space Coastal channel, where I hope to inspire you to create space in your life for fun. Thank you.